Welcome back, Math 241, Lecture 46, out of uh, probably somewhere around 60 before we're all said and done. So we are in Chapter 8. We will not go further than Chapter 8. In fact, Chapter 9 starts Math 242, which most of you will be heading toward, I would presume. Um, so we have quite a bit to do in Chapter 8. It's still pretty loaded with things that we have not uh, encountered yet. So let's go ahead today and also Friday in here we'll do power series. Still puts us just a little bit ahead I guess according to the syllabus but uh, we're going to need it when we get to uh, some of the later uh, parts of chapter 8. Alright so let's go ahead with power series. Test grades by the way, the, those that I've graded, I think I've graded 10, uh, are pretty good couple of scores over 100. Um, of course, you're only happy with that if it's on your paper. Me? Anybody. Oh, Anybody. I, I mean, it <laughs> doesn't necessarily you. thrill you that, you know, person two seats down got a 102. Uh, kind mm -hmm. of thrill you, I would think, if you got one yourself. All right, power series. So I intended to have all the tests graded, but I think I did a little more moving than grading yesterday. So um, got kind of closed out in available hours. Um, we will have a lot more series starting at zero now instead of starting at one. Uh, one of the reasons is that we'll want a some kind of a constant as the first term, and instead of adjusting the exponent in here, we'll um, just start it at zero and we'll establish that first term as a constant. So notice the subscripts on the constants are different, so we're allowing for different coefficients on different terms as we progress, and then we're going to increase the power of x as we progress to the right. So it's kind of like an infinitely termed polynomial is what we end up with. So at n equals 0, we get c sub 0, x to the 0, which is 1. So there's one of the reasons why we want to start at 0. We get a constant. n equals 1, c sub 1, x to the 1. n equals 2, c sub 2, x squared, and so on. So we get this polynomial looking thing. Um, we'll be able to deal with some, some of the partial sums and we'll be able to get different polynomials when we truncate, but if we let it run forever, it is a power series, but it behaves in a lot of ways like a polynomial. So we will determine when these things converge. They'll converge for certain values of x. I um, mean, you can probably pick one off right away. What is one value of x that would cause even this generic power series to converge? If x were what value? Zero. zero. If x were zero, then all these terms disappear and it converges to c sub zero. So you're going to get some values of x for which it converges, and you'll see some categories develop as we look at these problems some other values of x for which the series diverges. Um, okay, there's another type. Let's get an example of this type. In fact, we've already seen this one. Can't get a whole lot simpler than this one, so it's a good one to start with. So we don't have any varying coefficients as we go. All we have is powers of x. We've already seen it. So when x, excuse me, when n is 0, x to the 0 is 1. When n is 1, x to the first, x squared, x cubed. Well, we say they converge for some values and diverge for other values. What is this particular power series? What have we already classified this under? That is, if you were actually talking to me today. Geometric. Geometric. Uh, 
<clears throat> and not all infinite geometric series converge. When do they converge? When the power is less than absolute value. Okay, so if the absolute value of the ratio is less than 1, uh, we know that it converges. What is the ratio on this particular infinite geometric series? X. X. Because we're multiplying by X as we go. So it will converge if the absolute value of X is less than 1. So we have a so-called interval of convergence from negative 1, not including negative 1, all the way up to 1, but not including 1. So for any other value of x that we choose in this interval, this is a convergent series. For anything outside of this, it diverges. Okay, another type of power series, and really this is a uh, the first one that we looked at is a more specialized version of the one we're about to look at. So instead of just having increasing powers of x as we progress to the right, we have increasing powers of the binomial term x minus a. So the first one ought to be c sub 0, x minus a to the 0. Well, that's just c sub 0. n is 1. When n is 2, n is 3. And we get a similar type of expression, except powers it's a power series, but not a power series in x. It's a power series in the binomial x minus a. So why would this be a subcategory of this? This is kind of a more generalized version. This should work for any a value. This only works for the a value of 0, right? If a were 0 in this one, we'd really be back up here to this one. So they're really all power series of this type. And if A happens to be 0, it's a simpler looking power series. Now, when we have varying coefficients, we're not going to have that nice luxury that we had here when the coefficients were all 1, where you can say, OK, what do I, how, how do I progress from term 1 to term 2, term 2 to term 3? We're multiplying by x. We don't have that luxury here because of the differing coefficients as we progress. So this is not going to be, unless it's a really specialized problem, it's not going to be an infinite geometric series. It is a power series. It's a power series in x minus a. Sometimes it is said to be centered at x equals a. And I think that will become more clear as we progress to this section why we would say that it's centered at x equals a. All right, so there's the most generic version. We'll see some like this, but it's the same thing except a is 0. All right, we're going to look at um, probably four examples, maybe more. Uh, I don't know how many of those we'll get to today. And then we'll kind of classify what happens in those um, different problems into some categories of answers. And we'll see that all types of answers will basically fall into one of three categories when we're done. So the series n factorial, x to the n, now we think n factorial, that's getting larger as n gets larger. x to the n may or may not be getting larger as, x gets lar as n gets larger, because we really don't know what x is. 
So the tendency is to see this and say, well, clearly that's divergent, but we don't know what x is. <clears throat> so the question is, when does this converge? And we have no idea, but after some examples, you'll see solutions to problems as varied as they are falling into categories. But we don't really know what's going to happen here. So this is a test that has a lot of carryover throughout the rest of this chapter, the ratio test. We're going to take the n plus first term divided by the predecessor, the nth term, way out there to the right. We're going to see what we get. We know that if L is less than 1, what's our conclusion? Converge. Convergent. If L is greater than 1, divergent, and what happens if L is equal to 1? Can't make it. Okay, no conclusion, so the test fails. All right, for this problem, the n plus first term would be what? Okay, x to the n plus 1. So everywhere there's an n, we should now have an n plus 1. So there's the value of the n plus first term. I've got absolute value brackets started here. Do I really need those? No, because it's never going to be negative. Okay, well, unless x right, is unless x is negative. So x is unknown, so we better keep them around. Um, and you'll see in... Maybe not in this problem so much, but as in, in other problems, the absolute value will certainly come into play. So there's the n plus first term. We want to divide it by its predecessor, which is the nth term, which is normally the way it's handed to us. Um, what is n plus 1 factorial? How could we rewrite that? Good. n plus 1 times n factorial. Had a question after class yesterday uh, about that. If, if that troubles you in any way, just put in some numbers. 8 factorial is 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 all the way back to 1, which is really 8 times what? 7 factorial. So. Um, just enough to convince yourself that that is, in fact, true for n plus 1 factorial. Uh, just for the purposes of reduction, x to the n plus 1 is x to the n times x to the 1. Question, Jacob? Would uh, n plus 2 factorial be n plus 1 times n plus 2 times n factorial? Uh, there's a variety of things that could be. So if you had n plus 2, factorial, if you wrote it out, it would be that. So you could say that is n plus 2 times what? n plus 1 factorial? Or, depending on what you needed it for, you could say it's n plus 2 times n plus 1 times n factorial. That might be a little more advantageous, especially if you had one of these terms around numerator and denominator, and you wanted to knock it out with a like term in the opposite position. So it kind of just depends on what you need. So back to the kind of planning ahead, we knew we had an n factorial here, so it's advantageous to have one in the numerator as well. We've got an x to the n down here, so maybe it's advantageous. Not that we couldn't do the problem without it, but it's nice to just kind of mark out like terms, numerator and denominator. And that's where we are, n factorial over n factorial. 
x to the n over x to the n. n plus 1 is inside the absolute value brackets, but it's unaffected by the absolute value, so we can bring it out front. So the x that remains might be positive, might be negative, so let's keep the absolute value notation around. Does it really matter what x is here? When n is allowed to increase without bound, this term gets larger and larger and larger. What is the only value for x that would keep this thing from getting larger and larger and larger? Zero. 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 So this only converges when x is zero. For all other values of x, this diverges. So that's not actually a very interesting problem if it only converges for the single value of x equals zero. But the reason for the example is to we're going to kind of see what categories our answer falls into. There's one of the categories. It converges for a single value only. In this case, that single value is x equals zero. Questions on that before it gets moved? So these kind of increase in difficulty as we go to. I don't think any of them are ridiculous. There's one that's uh, kind of testy. Notice this starts at 1, so we're not going to have that um, constant term. We probably would want to start this one at 1 for what reason? kind of problematic if we started it at zero because we'd have division by zero, which would not be delightful. So at n equals one, we've got that to the first over one, that squared over two, that cubed over three, and so on. So it's kind of a polynomial but it's got an infinite amount of terms. So we want to do the ratio test to see when this converges. If, in fact, it ever does. I guess we could determine that now. It would certainly converge at what x value? Three. So if x were three, this thing would clearly converge. Are there more values for which it converges? We don't know that. And we'll see a problem that converges for all values. That, I think, is our example that follows this. So we do have some differing things that happen. All right, ratio test. What is the n plus first term? x minus three to the n plus one. Does that work? Take the n plus first term, divide it by the nth term. You'll be experts at the ratio test very soon if you're not already. The n plus one. We should write it as x minus 3 to the n times x minus 3. Okay. So we can cancel it. And then when we multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. It's just n. And even if you did not do what Nicole said, hopefully you would be able to say to yourself, what's x minus 3 to the n plus 1 divided by x minus 3 to the n? 
there's going to be one of them left in the numerator, right? Because it's raised to one power larger. But that's a cleaner reduction when you do separate it in the numerator. Uh, n and n plus 1, we could, in fact, bring those out in front. There's no question about them being positive when n starts at 1. But the other, which is x minus 3, is still variable. We don't know if that's positive or negative or when it's positive and negative. So let's leave it inside the absolute value notation. What happens to n over n plus 1 as n gets infinitely large? That goes to 1. So 1 times the absolute value of x minus 3 is the absolute value of x minus 3. So there's our limit. There's our L. And we want to know where this converges. So we would want L to be what? Less than 1. So there's our, before this point, we've had, in a lot of cases, a numerical answer. Yesterday we ended class, I think we ended class with an example that had E for our answer. E being larger than 1 meant that the series diverged. Here we have absolute value of x minus 3. This is only going to converge when that is less than 1. So that means that what is inside the absolute value notation is kind of trapped between negative 1 and 1. So that's the algebraic solution to that absolute value inequality. We can add 3. So in the middle, we get x, which is what we want. Here we get 4, and here we get 2. So for all values of x between 2 and 4, this particular power series is a convergent power series. So at this point in time, we might make some adjustments to this. But at this point in time, the interval of convergence is that interval. So for all values of x, anywhere from 2 to 4, but excluding 2 to 4, we already knew one of those values, right? Didn't we already know 3 from the original power series? 3 was going to cause it to converge, but apparently it's not just 3. It's any value between 2 and 4, excluding 2 and 4. Now, if x were 2, What would this be? It'd be 1. And our answer to the ratio test, the L value would be 1. Now, when the L value is 1, what does the ratio test tell us? It doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't give a conclusion. So we probably ought to check out 2. Since it, the ratio test fails to tell us what happens at 2, we ought to check that out ourselves. Is the same thing true at 4? Yes. If x is 4, the limit is 1. The ratio test fails to tell us what happens at x equals 4. We better check this out ourselves. So we're going to check out 2 and 4 separately. So our endpoints, x equals 2. And x equals 4. Let's go all the way back to our original series. So if x is 2, I'll just go ahead and write it in. 2 minus 3 to the n all over n. Well, 2 minus 3 to the n is really what? Negative 1. 
to the end. Hey, that looks familiar. Convergent because? Okay, we've already done that, right? This is an alternating harmonic. Therefore, it's convergent. So even though the ratio test, the limit was 1, fails to give us a conclusion, we kind of do that by hand, do that ourselves, and we determine that it, in fact, converges at x equals 2. Let's do the same thing at x equals 4. Go back to the original power series. What is that one? Divergent. 4 minus 3 is 1. 1 to the n. Well, 1 to the n is just 1. I think we know about that one, too. What do we know about 1 over n from n equals 1 to infinity? That diverges. That is not alternating harmonic, but just the harmonic series. So initially, we said our interval of convergence based on the ratio test was from 2 to 4, excluding the endpoints. Now we know we also include this in the area for which this particular power series converges. So our final interval of convergence is 2 to 4. We don't want to include 4. So there's the interval of convergence. I used the term centered at x equals a a while ago. This should be centered at x equals 3, if that's the case, right? Is our interval centered at x equals 3? That's right in the middle of 2 and 4, so it is centered. At x equals 3, and one more piece of terminology and that is the radius of convergence. In this case is 1. So starting at that centering value, which in this case is 3, we're going to go basically one unit to the left and one unit to the right. So if we were swinging an arc of radius 1, we would basically capture our interval of convergence. So interval of convergence, it is centered at the A value from the original series and the radius of convergence. How many units away from that centering value are we getting? We're getting one unit away. Is that OK? All right, this will be our last example. I know there's quite a bit of time left, but this one's a little bit of a battle. This is called the Bessel function. Kind of a mess. Uh, there are some pictures of the Bessel function on page 595. Kind of what the what this is being used to model the the Bessel function. Um, let's see. It says that. Functions first arose when Bessel solved Kepler's equation for describing planetary motion. Since that time, these functions have been applied in many different physical situations, including the temperature distribution in a circular plate and the shape of a vibrating drum head. So I'm sure that piqued your interest, because that piqued mine. But it's a 
neat function, and we'll see something happen with this one that we haven't seen on a, another example. So when does it converge? When does it diverge? So we're going to use the ratio test. Can you see what a mess this might be? <coughs> what is the n plus first term? Negative 1, which this really doesn't matter because we are taking absolute value. So the alternating sign portion of the original and also this become irrelevant, but I'm going to go ahead and write it down. x to the 2n should become x to the 2n plus 1, quantity n plus 1, that matters in this problem. 2 to the 2n becomes 2 to the 2 times the quantity n plus 1, and this is kind of crazy looking. n factorial squared becomes n plus 1 factorial squared. So there's the n plus first term. Everywhere there was an n, we should have replaced it with an n plus 1. All right, let's go ahead in the denominator and write out the nth term the way it was given to us. And let's see what happens way out to the right as n gets infinitely large. Um, before we start knocking out like terms, uh, can I get rid of negative 1 to the n plus 1 and negative 1 to the n? I mean, at best, there they would be, I mean, it's going to be negative 1, right, which is going to be done away with, so there's no reason to carry those any further. Um, let's leave things where they are right now. x to the 2 times the quantity n plus 1. That would be x to the 2n plus 2. Same thing down here, 2 to the 2 times the quantity n plus 1. And let's write this as n plus 1 factorial twice. So that's in the numerator. Might be helpful. I mean, you might skip this step, but it might be helpful just because it'll get you thinking about reductions or separations in the numerator that might be helpful to get rid of some things in the denominator. So we've got another absolute value bar over here. All right, so in the numerator, let's go ahead and simplify some things as we go. How might we want to rewrite this term? <coughs> Okay, x to the 2n times x squared. And we want an x to the 2n to reduce with the other x to the 2n that's in the denominator. Similar fashion, 2 to the 2n plus 2 ought to be 2 to the 2n times 2 to the second. While we're rewriting things, we've got an n plus 1 factorial and another n plus 1 factorial. Let's rewrite both of those as n plus 1 times n factorial. Okay, so that's the numerator. We want to multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. So here's our denominator. Let's just take things that are in the opposite position and reverse those positions. So we're going to have an x to the 2n 
here, 2 to the 2n, n factorial, n factorial. Good old Mr. Bessel. Now what? The x to the 2n, the 2 to the 2n, and the n. So we have the limit of x squared over 4 times n plus 1. Okay. Now, how many of those things can we bring out front that are not affected by absolute value? One fourth. We can bring out the one fourth. And that n plus one is in the denominator, right? Two of them. And we do have the square root of x squared. Well, we're really not worried about that either, are we? I'll leave it. But it's it's really kind of does it's unaffected by the absolute value. Uh, n is going to approach infinity. Any before we go to the next step, any questions about the terms that knocked each other out, numerator and denominator, or what remains? Are all right with that? What happens to this term right here as n gets infinitely large? That goes to zero. How about our old friend x here? Well, really, x squared. If this term is going to zero for a single value of x that we choose, this part out in front eventually overtakes this, right? So it would be zero times whatever value we have here. It's not like this is changing as this is changing, and one could be getting smaller, the other one getting larger. This is a fixed value for a certain value of x. So it looks like we're going to get zero. That's a different kind of answer, because we would expect this as the L value. We would still have some work to do. When is the limit? the L value less than 1, when is this limit less than 1? It's always less than 1. L, which is 0, is always less than 1. So what does that say about convergence for this particular power series? Convergent for all values of X. So the interval of convergence this one is still centered where is this centered and you could even go back to the original version and see where it is centered we didn't have an x minus a we just had an x right so it's centered at 0 and what's the radius of convergence. Infinity. Also infinite, right? Is infinitely large. So we have seen what types of solutions? We have seen a single value of x as a solution. It only converged at that one value. We have seen an interval, 2 to 4, including 2. That was an interval of convergence. And then we've seen one that can be centered for, um, I mean, convergent for all values of x that we choose. So you'll see this theorem, and I think we've seen an example of each type in the book to this point. For a given power series, x minus a, remember a could be 0, and it'd be the simpler type. There are only three possibilities for convergence. It converges at a single value, namely the a value. Converges for all values of x. We just finished one of those. And there is a positive number such that the series converges. And this would be some interval. 
whether it includes or excludes the endpoints, we have to kind of do those separately, but it ultimately ends up being some interval. Um, I think this is probably, let's not start another example, but let's deal a little bit further with this one. I don't know how far back we need to go with that. Let's go back all the way to the original just to make sure. Let's see what, and this is a good lead in. I'm not trying to just use up a few minutes of class. Th this has some nice carryover into what we do later in Chapter 8. Um, let's look at a few of the partial sums. So let's look at what the first term would look like, which um, in this case, this would be n equals 0, right? So when we enter into this series, try to generate the first term, We'll enter in n equals 0, and what do we get? Mm -hmm. That to the 0, that x to the 0, 2 to the 0, 0 factorial. I think we, did we cover that? Did that come up yet? That 0 factorial by definition is 1. I think when you put in n equals 0, you're going to see that the first term is 1. So now we want to generate the first two terms. So we're going to put in n equals 0, which we already have, and also n equals 1. So it's going to be 1. What's the next term when n is 1? Negative 1 to the first, so it's going to be negative. x to the what power? <coughs> Squared, right, when n is 1? And when n is 1, what's the denominator? 4. That's not a real complicated looking polynomial. In fact, this one isn't complicated either. The, I like this one, the first one. 1, if we were to graph that, that'd be pretty simple. We could then graph this, when it, generating the n equals 0 and the n equals 1 term. What would that be if you graph that? Just the first two terms, kind of a truncated Bessel series. Parabola opening down, right? Shifted up one unit is, would be what that is. What'd you say, Jacob? <laughs> I said it's fat. Kind of fat? Yeah. Uh, you weren't talking about me, were you? <laughs> no. The, okay. The thing. I mean, it's factual, but let's not put it out there on television. <coughs> okay, so if we went to n equals 2. Negative 1 to the 2. Now we're back to positive, so we all gonna, are going to alternate signs. When n is 2, what do we get up here? x to the 4. That's not a surprise, is it? Because we have x to the 2n, so it's going to go up by multiples of 2 as we progress. And when n is 2, what do we get in the bottom? Well, that'd be 4, 2 to the 4th, which is 16. We'd have 2 factorial. 2 factorial is 2 squared, which is 4. 16 times 4, 64. Is that right? Another polynomial. Um, if you would graph this one, I mean, the original Bessel function looks kind of strange, but I guess the reason for going through something like this, that's not really strange. There's nothing strange about that one. There's really nothing strange about that one. That's a fourth degree polynomial. 
tell me something about fourth degree polynomials, kind of a, any generic fourth degree polynomial. How many times might they hit, hit the x axis? One. Four, right? Because they'd have four possible solutions. Um, how many changes in direction does a fourth degree polynomial have? Four. Three, oh. right? Because you take the derivative, which would be third degree, and set the derivative equal to zero, which would have three possible solutions. So we all know what this is. That's we don't need to, you know, debate this one. But this one, although we don't graph a whole lot of fourth degree polynomials, a fourth degree polynomial there's one, two, three, four probably is going to look something like that, right? And I started this kind of up one unit. So there's the S sub 3, the, sequ the uh, sequence of partial sums going all the way up to n equals 2. Without generating this, I think I have this one written down. Um, there's when n equals 0, n equals 1 n equals 2. We would expect the signs to alternate. We would expect the power of x to be what? X to the sixth. You can probably see why convergence happens because these values, the denominator begins to overtake the numerator so that eventually the denominator gets so big that it really doesn't matter what the numerator is. That's why this converges for all values of x. But that's a sixth degree polynomial, six possible roots, five changes in direction. Not anything we want to you know, graph on a regular basis, but it's not ridiculous. Some of these are pictured together on page 596. You'll see a lot of these sequence of partial sums graphed as separate truncating polynomials. And you'll see some similarities. You'll see that they overlap in a very significant way. And as you go further out, you'll see that they overlap even more as you work your way out further. Because this term is really kind of, in a sense, almost insignificant. But that's an interesting diagram. We'll see the same phenomenon when we get to Maclaurin and Taylor polynomials, that as you get certain polynomials, um, you'll see some overlap. And then if you get a Taylor series and let it run, you'll see some interesting phenomenon there. So we're truncating here. But we are gathering an additional term as we go. And we'll, we'll see that illustrated later in this chapter. All right, we won't meet in this class physically tomorrow. And I'll see you in here on Friday.